you turn with me to Genesis 10, please? <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 10, verse number 6. All right, Genesis chapter number 10, verse 6. Brother uh, uh, Caldwell, will you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. All right, Genesis chapter number 10, and the 10th chapter of Genesis is commonly referred to as what's called the Table of the Nations. And uh, the reason for that is obvious because it's the genealogies you find in, uh, in Genesis 10. Look at verse number 1. These are generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. And then it continues on down, starts with Japheth, because Japheth's the elder. He's the oldest among them. And then it finishes up with Shem. And uh, verse number uh, uh, 25, let's see, verse 21, to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. Eber is the uh, old uh, uh, word for Hebrew. So Shem becomes the father of the Hebrew. And then you have the genealogy of Ham, verse number 6, Genesis 10, 6, the sons of Ham, Cush, Mitzrayim, Phut, and Canaan. And uh, these are ancient names for ancient places. Uh, the land of Cush was in Africa. Mitzrayim is Egypt. That's the name for ancient Egypt. Phut is Libya. And Canaan, of course, is the land of Canaan. In Genesis chapter number 10 and verse number 21 to Shem, I'd like to mention this when we're mentioning Shem. The word Shem is a Hebrew word that means name. Baruch Hashem means to bless the name. And uh, the name of yod heh vau heh is the name of God. There's a big controversy today as to how you pronounce that. Some say Yahweh, some say Jehovah. I stick with Jehovah. And uh, that is the name of God. And the Hebrew calls it the ineffable name. In plainer words, unpronounceable. This is why there's such a problem with pronouncing it today, because they never pronounced that name because it was so holy it's the name of God. That's his name. Uh, Elohim, if you'll find in Genesis chapter number 1, the beginning, God, Elohim, is not his name. That's simply a generic word that refers to a deity and, uh, and, and used in that case of the true Lord God. But Elohim could also refer to a bunch of demons or fallen angels. So you have to be very careful of stuff like that. But the name of God is yod heh vau -Hey. So when you say Shem, you're literally saying name, okay? God attached his name with Shem. And the reason for that is because it is blessed be the Lord God of Shem, not Japheth and not Ham. So we have contrasted here two distinct lines, bloodlines, coming forth from Noah. One is Ham, and we get Nimrod from him, Genesis 10, 6, and the other one is Shem, and we get Abraham from him. It's important to understand that and say why. Because the Old Testament is laying out for you the transmission of truth, the line of truth. It is showing you how that God is going to inspire his word and his word is only going to be with one people. Now, all you have to do is study a little bit and get back into ancient history and you'll find out that there was a general knowledge of many truths scattered among all the peoples on the face of the earth. They had a general knowledge of truths, and but they did they were not the source of absolute truth, and the reason for that is because the people with the source of absolute truth are going to write scripture. They're going to write the Bible, and the Bible, of course, came from the Jew. So now here in Genesis chapter number ten, you have showing up for you in verse number eight. Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Nimrod is mentioned here and listed. He is a son of Noah. He is the 13th from Adam. 
and he is the great grandson of Noah. So, Shem, so Nimrod is a direct descendant of Noah. And uh, of course, all of us are descendants of Adam. There's only one man, one man on the earth who populated this whole earth. And from that one man, Adam, first man, Adam, all of us came, whether it make a difference who you are or where you came from. But we have a split after the flood from the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the Bible is very clear about this. It wants you to follow the genealogy throughout the Old Testament. It's very important. If you'll remember this past Wednesday night when I was in class, we were in here talking about the, uh, the Israelites when they came in, God said, you destroy man, woman, suckling, and child. May it show no mercy, no, none whatsoever. You'd think that's a mighty harsh punishment or a harsh uh, uh, mandate for God to give these people. And you have to understand what's going on. Why would he want them to do that? Of course, I set that in, uh, in uh, contrast to that murderer over there in, uh, in Iraq who cut the head off of that little girl that I posted on the web page for a while and then just recently murdered uh, James Foley, a journalist, uh, cut his head off and, and filmed it. And they're proud of it. And they post it on the, I don't know, what Facebook or whatever website they have, whatever they do. They wanted people to see it. And they have got the message across, by the way. And the generals now are lining up to get this president to do something about this, not just send some airstrikes over there. They want this president to do something about wiping these people from the face of the earth. And that's, uh, that's what they're saying. They say, you do, you do not negotiate with people like that. They must be exterminated. But in any event, you have in Genesis chapter number 10, Nimrod. Now, it's important to understand this. Nimrod shows up. He's mentioned. And if you'll notice what he's associated with, verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Verse 11, out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, the city of Rehoboth and Kala. So Nimrod is associated with Babylon, with, Nin with Nineveh, with all these ancient cities that sprung up in the valley of Mesopotamia, in the area between the rivers, in the cradle of civilization that we talked about last Sunday, Nimrod is associated with them. Essentially what we're saying is, what the Bible is saying, is that Nimrod is the builder of Babylon. So what we have here is the beginning of Babylon. This is the foundation of Babylon. And that's important to understand that because now we know the source of it. We know where it came from. Babylon came through Ham by Nimrod who built it. Now something happened at Babylon that distinguishes it from anything else that ever happened on the face of the earth at Babel. And that's where God confounded their languages. And uh, how many came out of that? We have no idea. But God confounded their languages, and they were unable to understand each other. And so they migrated with whatever group they could, they could understand, and away they went. And he did that, of course, to separate men uh, who, had, in Genesis chapter number 10, were going to build a tower that would reach into the heavens. Now, the actual... Uh, uh, dimensions of what this tower looked like, there's a lot of controversy. Some say it looks like an Asherah, just a pole sticking up in the ground. Others say it looked like a ziggurat, which is a form of a pyramid, especially you'll see them in uh, South America, the Indians. <coughs> the Maya, the Aztec, they built, they built these ziggurats, these pyramids with, with steps on them leading up to the top where they offered human sacrifice. They would cut the beating heart out of their victim and offer it to their God. Blood flowed from that place like you would not believe. And so this is human sacrifice. And human sacrifice goes all the way back in, in antiquity, back to, to, uh, to uh, uh, Nimrod, and undoubtedly even before that. For Cain offered his brother, did he not? He sacrificed him to his God, to himself, the one that he worshipped, the one that he cared for. Cain loved Cain, folks. That was the problem. Self-love goes all the way back to the garden. So these, uh, what this was, what the Tower of Babel was, that you can take the pick, whatever you want to. I don't, I don't, I don't get, I don't get into something like that because you can't prove it, one way or the other. It's not to me. It's not important. What's important to me was the purpose of the thing and who built it and what it was there for. 
And it was was undoubtedly a monument. Undoubtedly, it was something that they had built to make their name. Let us make a name for ourselves on the earth. And that's what it was about. Now, the point is, though, that it was built in rebellion against God. This man, Nimrod, is the first rebel. He is a genuine, died-in-the-wool rebel. And notice that I just threw out a moment ago. What number was he from Adam? Thirteenth. He's the thirteenth from Adam. So that immediately connects the number thirteen with rebellion. And uh, you'll find that the, the theme of these numbers and what they stand for runs true all the way through the Word of God. It doesn't change. It stays true. And so the number thirteen has always, uh, as far back as man can remember, uh, is associated with rebellion. So who's he rebelling against? He's rebelling against God. In the book of Romans, chapter number 1 said, When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, became vain in their imagination. The evil heart was darkened. And professing themselves to wise, they became, to be wise, they became fools and changed the, the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like incorruptible man or something that you can see and touch and feel with your hands. So Nimrod becomes the founder and establisher and the builder of the first rebellion, organized, systematic universal, one world, rebellion against God. Now, when you go back and study a little bit in, in, uh, in tradition and history, this is not Bible, but this is tradition and history. His wife's name was Semiramis. Semiramis was quite a character. Semiramis was the wife of Nimrod, but she was also his mother. And I'll explain that to you in just a moment. So how could she be both his wife and his mother? Well, that, we'll explain that. But she is unique in that. She's first of all his wife. Nimrod dies, and when Nimrod dies, she tells the people that Nimrod has become the sun god. So they worship him as the sun god, and so therefore he becomes deity, and he's elevated to the, to the position of deity. It's not unusual at all to find mortal man being elevated to the position of deity. Remember something. The Lord Jesus Christ was God who came down from heaven and God who went back to heaven. He was God who came down from heaven and became a man, the God-man. The Lord Jesus Christ was never exalted to the position of deity. He was always deity. That's important to understand. There was never a moment that he he wasn't God. But he was exalted to the position of deity, of course, by the word of Semiramis. And then she became pregnant. (coughs) <coughs> and she said that she was pregnant by virtue of the gods, a supernatural act. And by virtue of this supernatural act, she became pregnant. She bore a son, and his name was Tammuz. If you'll remember reading the book of Ezekiel, the women are found behind the wall when they dig in the wall, and they're weeping for who? All right. Now, here's the connection. She bears a son. His name is Tammuz. In the process of time, Tammuz is killed by a wild boar, a wild boar. And so he descends into the underworld, you know, Sheol, Hades, the unseen state of the dead that we talked about before. He descends into the underworld. So Semiramis weeps over her son who has descended into the, un- into the underworld. She weeps for him, weeps over him. And the fact that her weeping is so strong and so powerful and so pointed that she's able to bring him back up. She's able to bring him back up and resurrect him from the underworld. All right. Therefore, she becomes, now notice carefully, when he comes back up out of the underworld, lo and behold, he is Nimrod, resurrected from the dead. And this happens in the springtime. And being Nimrod resurrected from the dead, from the underworld, then he has become not only a god that dies and ascends to heaven, which was her husband, but now she gave birth to Tammuz, who becomes Nimrod, so she's his mother. And now she's called the mother of God. See how it goes? And another term that's attached to Semiramis is queen of heaven. And Jeremiah chapter number 44, Jeremiah hit this thing time and time and time again. He got vehemently angry with Israel for worshiping the queen of heaven. 
And the reason he did is because the queen of heaven is Semiramis. And she's called by other names and other cultures. Here's what's important. The source of all of this junk out here about Diana and about Ishtar and Astarte and uh, and all of these other, all these gods, Baal and Moloch and all of this, they all came from these two. They all came from these two. They came from Nimrod and Semiramis. Now the general picture that I gave you of how that he's resurrected and that he and that she, by, the res, by raising Tem, Tammuz up, he becomes Nimrod. She therefore was his mother. She's the mother of God because he was a god. And so all of this stuff these people are accepting, and now they're in the springtime. They worship through festivals and feasts. At a certain time, this uh, this god that was this god that was resurrected, uh, this all uh, becomes firmly ingrained in the hearts and the minds of the people, and it's been handed down to you. And to this very day, a lot of that tradition has become the tradition of. <coughs> Western Europeans, people all over the earth, it has become their tradition, and they don't realize what's going on. They don't realize how they're affected by this stuff. And there's an, there's to me, there is a there's there's it, it's in layers. It's layered. In other words, the lower layers are those who don't know anything about it. All they know is that uh, this is tradition. We do this, and it's no big deal. But then, as the layer as you rise in understanding of what's going on, then you rise in accountability. And you rise in the initiation into the mystery religions. Uh, a lot of people today don't realize it, but they're worshiping Lucifer. They're worshiping Lucifer. They have no idea, but they are. Uh, not consciously. If you said to one of them, well, you're a devil worshiper, well, they'd get so mad at you that you know you unbelievable. But the truth of the matter is, Lucifer is very good at masquerading his identity. And so this story about Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz is, is, uh, as, I saw, as I said to you a moment ago, is a, is a tradition, is a historical tradition that's been handed down from generation to generation. Alexander Hislop did a work called The Two Babylons. And in the two Babylons, he spells this out, along, along with men like Ralph Woodrow and others who've gotten into this, and a, a lot of work's been done today, that deal with it. You say, why is it important to me? It's important to us because as we study the Bible, we see how that line will come all the way down to the Antichrist. For Nimrod is an Antichrist. Why? Semiramis, according to some traditions, taught the people that Tammuz was the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. That she was impregnated supernaturally. That her son Tammuz was born from a supernatural impregnation. And that therefore Tammuz was the fulfillment of Genesis chapter number 3 verse 15. And what's Genesis 3.15? It's the, it's the first direct prophecy in the Bible of the coming Messiah. All right? So here she's teaching the people that she's impregnated by supernatural power, star child, transpermia, all this stuff. They find these artifacts. There's an artifact that looks like an airplane with wings, thousands of years old, paintings on cave walls, all kinds of stuff going on out there that just doesn't fit in the historical narrative, yet it's real. Something was here on this earth that had an enor enormous intelligence, no question about it. And so she, she's telling these people that Tammuz is a product of a supernatural uh, 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 impregnation. And so he dies, is buried, and what happens to him? He's raised up. He's resurrected. What is that mimicking? She has in her, in her lap, here's this woman who is impregnated by a supernatural power who has a child born to her. Here's the picture of the woman and the child. You can find this everywhere. Semiramis and Tammuz. Here they are together, and you're going to find it all over the place. And here she's impregnated by supernatural power. She brings forth this son. This son, she says, is a, prophet, is a, is a fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And so now we have... A woman today who is called the Queen of Heaven, 
And you see her all the time with a son in her arms or in her lap. And she is Mary of the Roman Catholic Church. Very important. Very important. The Mary of the Roman Catholic Church is not the Mary of the New Testament. They're not the same. They're not the same. The Mary of the New Testament would have nothing to do with this identity that they put on her. Now, they call her the Queen of Heaven. They call her the Queen of Heaven. And these people are not stupid. Some of the, some of the, some of the smartest people in the world are Roman Catholics. And some of their commentaries are so good on so many different things. So very good. But <clears throat> when it comes to some of these issues like this, it's almost like they put blinders on. She's the mother of God. She's Mary the Virgin, supernaturally impregnated, has a son. The son dies, buried, and then rose again. So what's happening is that in the ancient past, a primitive knowledge of the virgin bearing a son who would die and be raised again was a knowledge that had spread out among many people. How do we know that? There's a number of ways of knowing that. One of the ways that we know that is through astronomy, is through the study of the stars. So how do you do that? I mean, what's that got to do with it? It has to do with when you go back and see what they believed, who grew up these zodiacs, and when you see what they, the meanings that they attached to the stars and the constellations. Here's a great mistake, folks. This is a big error that people make today, and they're arrogant in doing this. We are so much smarter than they used to be. No, we're not. No, we are not. We are not so much smarter than they used to be. The idea is that you've got some poor cave man living out here in some cave somewhere carrying a club around with him. They can't communicate or, uh, uh, verbally, so they, <clears throat> and it's this kind of caveman stuff, and they warp this thing over the top of the head, and they drag it back, and they all pounce on it and eat like a pack of dogs, and that's where we all came from. Now, that's the kind of garbage that they're trying to teach some people. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing. Remember last week when I told you that all of a sudden, 3000 B.C., language explodes? All of a sudden, 3000 B.C., advanced civilizations explode? All of a sudden, 3000 B.C., advanced technology explodes? Why? How do you explain that? And where does it explode? It explodes in the, in the plains of Shinar. In the valley of Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, why all of a sudden, if all this stuff evolved over eons of time, why all of a sudden does it explode? And here it is, and it's a reality, and you've got to deal with it. And the reason for that is obvious. When they came down off of the Mount Ararat from that ark, they carried that knowledge with them. How much did they know? They knew a whole lot more than we give them credit for. They certainly did. There's no question about it. And that's a separate study in itself. I've been digging a little bit into it, and uh, there's just so much to dig into. You can only got one shovel. You can't dig with so much. <laughs> you need a shovel and a rock and a jackhammer and a, and a Lord knows what else to try to get into all this stuff. But the truth is there's so much material available, folks. That it just blows your mind. And there's so many rabbit trails, and there's so many dead ends, and there's so much stuff that just is just a bunch of fanciful conjecture. There's so much stuff out there that... That, that you go so far with him and you find out, well, this guy's got an agenda. This is all about his, a preconceived notion, an idea of what he believes, and he's going to use facts to back it up, but it doesn't, it doesn't take you anywhere. Yeah. So when you get into this, I'm going to stick with the Bible. But the Bible, folks, is the book. Amen. This is the Word of God. <laughs> the Word of God. <laughs> not the Word of Einstein. Not the Word of Charles Lawson. Not the Word of the Baptist. It is the Word of God. Therefore, it's infinite, and it's left up to us by the power of the Holy Spirit to discern what's going on. So you have the idea then of this of this uh, of this of this ignorant evolution, which is a bunch of garbage. As I said to you a moment ago, we know this. We know that all of a sudden all this stuff exploded, and it did. It came on the scene. Here it is, and we don't find millions and millions of millions of transitional forms between. Some, some form here that evolved into this form, you don't find it. You find millions of this form and millions of this form, but you don't find millions of in-between. So evolution is a bunch of garbage. And uh, this past week I posted, if you'll, get, if you'll get on the website, you'll notice that I've changed the face of it completely. And the navigation's on the left-hand side. And at the bottom of the navigation, you'll find links and archive. 
If you'll go to the archive section of the web page, you'll find some, some uh, documents that I've posted on there written by Jeremy James. Jeremy James is, a, um, is an Irishman, a very smart Irishman. Uh, and he has done some excellent work on the uh, on, arch on 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 uh, evolution, and if you haven't read that, you ought to read it. Read what he has to say about evolution. But I just posted. Now this is important. I just posted uh, last night or or four o'clock this morning, somewhere in there. I posted a document that he has just written about Babylon, Nimrod, London and Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. You say, why is it important? It's important for this reason. And this brings us into the stars. He's done a lot of research, spent a lot of time researching the symbols, methods, message of the Illuminati, or whatever you want to call them. The one-worlders, the ones who are, who the elitist, the ones who intend to bring about a one-world government. He's done a lot of research in that area. And I can tell you ahead of time, I don't agree with, uh, with this dear brother on uh, uh, some of the things that, uh, about theology with him, about especially eschatology. But as far as his work in this area is concerned, it's excellent. And if you have the time, you ought to read, what he's, uh, read that document about Nimrod, Babylon, London, Queen Beatrix, I forget the title of that thing, but anyway, here's the, here's the thesis. You can go across London, all right, London's a huge town, and you can look at the position of monuments, certain churches, and certain landmarks, and then you can superimpose on top of that, that means, you know, to put a schematic down on the top of it, of the constellations, certain figures in the constellations, and you will be amazed at how they connect. In plainer words, whoever built this centuries ago knew when they were building it that it would match perfectly what's above. One of the doctrines of, of occultism is that as above, so below. So the signs in the heavens that God told them, don't be, what was it, what word do you use? Don't be mystified. What? Dismayed. dismayed. Don't be dismayed with the signs of the heavens. Remember Nimrod. Remember the tower into the heavens. Remember the connection with the heavens. Remember what they see above them. They see the creation. All right. The constellations are 12. It's a circle. All, when you go out at night and you look up at these constellations, you say to yourself, how in the world did they get a, a Aquarius out of this? How did they get the Virgo out of this? How did they get Taurus out of that? How did, they, how did this creature come about because of these stars? You, I, it, it's, it's just mind-boggling. It's because of an ancient knowledge handed down to them. And if you look at Psalm 19, you'll see why. That the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Night after night uttereth speech. And when you look at that, you say to yourself, aha, they had a knowledge of something that we don't readily understand today. So the heavens, the constellations, the star clusters, the arrangement of the stars, take it up here, pull it down, and hold it over London, and you'll see where they connect one after another, after another, after another, after... Here's the constellation Orion. Here's the constellation Arcturus. Here's another constellation. Here's a constellation. Here's a constellation. The same pattern that's in the heavens is the pattern of the way these things are laid out. What's that tell you? Number one, it tells you that somebody very smart has an agenda. Number two, it tells you that they know what's up there and they know what they're going to do down here. Number three, they're doing all of this, but they don't do it publicly. They do it, they do it uh, in the dark, in secret. That's why the secret societies, that's why the mystery religions, that's why the initiation, you initiate. As you are initiated into this religion, you understand more and more and more of it as you rise in its ranks. 
Then, when I read that, I thought to myself, now, Brother James, did I not read about Washington, D.C.? Have not I read that Washington, D.C. has the same type of patterns over the streets, over the monuments, over the structure of the city? You remember that Washington, D.C. was laid out by a Frenchman? This is no, this is no aspersion on the French. <laughs> In the time I, you know, uh, but it was laid out by a, a European, and these, 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 uh, these, these symbols, which are very impo- important to the occult world, very important, are to be found all over Washington, D.C. Now, have you ever noticed Knoxville, Tennessee? Knoxville just grew. It grew from, from horse trails and, and buckboard trails, and, and there is one thing in Knoxville, though, I'm not sure about exactly here in town or not, but if you go to Dandridge, Tennessee, if you care anything about history, go downtown to Dandridge, and Dandridge is, is I think, the second oldest town. Jonesboro is the oldest city in Tennessee. Third. Third. Second. Dandridge is the second oldest town in Tennessee. You'll find the original stagecoach trail that led from Washington down to the south and all the way through the west, and it cut right smack through Dandridge, Tennessee. Now, that's just a little bit of history, if you care anything about history. I mean, they've got a, something built right there where the, uh, uh, where the old uh, where they, the hotel they stayed in and, and got on the stagecoach, and I've never been on a stagecoach. I'd hate to go 600 miles on one. How you doing? <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be a long way. Somebody? Yes, sir. Well, now that's a good question about when. But, you know, in 1666, 666, and you being a historian, you know that. What happened in London? Great Fire of London. And they say that the Great Fire of London, a lot of them say that that fire was started so that they could clean out a certain section of London to come in there and build these buildings to match the patterns in the heavens that they wanted to put down there in London. So they did. And that happened in 1666. And Rome was carrying on the tradition of, of battle. Absolutely. With the imperial cult. Rome, Rome, the emperors and Rome accommodated. Yeah. They accommodated Greek culture. They accommodated anything that came in there. They liked it. They accommodated it. Yeah. Kind of like the Catholic Church. Y- yes. And yeah. so, so did what? Uh, yes. Uh, it's, Rome, in a lot of ways, was a melting pot. The old Babylonian religion, the Pontiff and all of that, that came from Babylon, and but Rome accepted it and received it in. So their, so their, uh, so their uh, Caesar became the Pontifus Maximus with his Vestal Virgins and all the rest of it, you know, that attended and all that. It didn't start with Rome. It started in Babylon. Anyway, if you look at Washington, D.C., you can look, you can see how that these patterns continue. So what does that tell you? What does that say about America? I'm not saying that that curses America. Has God blessed America? You better believe he's blessed America. He has blessed us beyond measure. But it tells you that there was a motive in building Washington the way it was built, that there was an overruling mind, a mind, a principle, a, a, a purpose by the elite in what they wanted to establish in this nation, what they wanted to do. All right, now that brings us back to the heavens, and it brings us back to Nimrod, and it brings us back to Semiramis and Tammuz, and it brings us back to Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So if I'm going to look at history, I'm going to ask myself this simple question. Do I look to Ham or do I look to Shem for revelation from God? Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, not Japheth and not Ham. All right. And that means that the revelation of God did not come through the Gentiles. Sorry, I'm a Gentile, didn't come through us. We are indebted to the Jews. We have a debt to them. To them were committed, Romans 9, the oracles of God. Moses, God said, write a book. But what happened to Israel? They were carried off into Babylonian captivity, right? Seventy years, Jeremiah prophesied, seven Sabbaths, Uh, They would be carried off into Babylonian captivity, and they stayed there. And while they were there, they said, Sing the songs of Zion for us, and they hung their harps on the willows. 
But if it had stopped at that, it would have been okay. But here's what happened to them in Babylon. They picked up elements of the Babylonian religion. And there, when they did that, the foundation for the Babylonian Talmud was laid. And the Babylonian Talmud is the instrument that a Jew uses today to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not reject the Lord Jesus based on the Bible. He rejects the Lord Jesus based on the Babylonian Talmud. So, where does that bring us? Where are we? How do, how do we look at that? What, what do we say when, we, uh, when I give you something like that uh, right now? What, uh, I'm going to ask you a question as a congregation of people. The simple things need to stay simple. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion, they should believe a lie and be damned, who love not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They rejected the truth. All right? The truth. What did Jesus say in John 14? I am the way, a truth, and the life. All right. He is the personification of the truth. Therefore, if I, if I receive the Lord Jesus Christ, I have received not only what he said in that sense of the truth, but I have received the person of the truth. Say, so why is that important? Because I have Christ in me who is the person of the truth. That is an anointing, the Apostle John called in 1 John. We have an anointing. That anointing is the person of Christ illuminated, opened up, made real to us by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the person of Christ. There is no way that an individual can truly receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and wind up out here in this occult religion and all this occult foolishness and this new age emerging church junk and all this garbage that's, that's springing forth now from Nimrod and Babylon. That's where it's coming from. Every bit of it, folks, remember this. You trace everything back to Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. It all goes back to them. Every culture, no doubt, has its own spin on it. You know, they have their own reason for applying certain things and this and that and blah, blah. But it goes back to them. And when you look at that and you say to yourself, then absolutely, absolutely, the Lord Jesus Christ is God's truth. He's the truth. If I've accepted the Son of the living God and the Holy Spirit is living in me as the person of Christ, because the Bible said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his, right? When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will not speak of himself, but what will he speak? He'll speak of me. The work of the Holy Spirit is to exalt, manifest, glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So how in the world, if you're a born-again believer and you're walking in fellowship and communion with God, can you wind up in the occult world? It's not going to happen. You may head toward that occult world, step into it for a while, but the one who knows you and loves you will chasten you and he'll bring you out of that or he'll take you home. That's the anointing we have. We have no need that any man teach us, he says. Why well, we've got that, but they don't have that. The unbeliever doesn't have that. The occult world, the Illuminati, whatever you want. And here's something else, and the reason I say that is this. The more you read this stuff and the, and the deeper you get into it, you start to ask yourself the question, how much of this stuff is spoon-fed to us for the sole purpose of confusion? Is not Babel, Babylon mean confusion and God's not the author of confusion I mean all you have to do is get on one website and this occult group's attacking this occult group I showed you how this one who said a true British Israelite believes this well what about this one who calls himself a Brit British Israelite he doesn't believe that you see they don't even agree among themselves there's no, there's no universal agreement and that's a big mistake to think they do they don't and some of them, are, it's like the Muslim, the Shiite and the, and the Sunni Muslim. They're mortal enemies. They hate each other. They despise each other. But the thing that pulls us together as Christians is there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Right. Ephesians chapter number 4. We may differ on eschatology. We may differ on polity. We may differ 
on, uh, on certain other things. But when it comes to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no difference. <coughs> Folks, he finished the work at the cross. And nothing can be added to it. And anything, any attempt to add anything to what Christ did on the cross is an abomination. Amen. Because you are, you are detracting from what he did. So, in, order, in plainer words, in order to keep your, your, uh, uh, your rudder straight and, 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 head, and head straight on this thing, you've got to, you've got to ever bear in mind the simple things. Amen. And the simple thing is that there's a Christ and an Antichrist. That's right. There's a truth and a lie. There's the right and the wrong. There's the absolute source of truth, shim, and nothing but a lie from Ham, sometimes a lie with a skin of the truth make you accept it, but once you open it up, it's nothing but corruption and lies and deceit. Right. So if I run up against something that, that I'm stumped with, you know, and if there's no clear light in the Word of God or through Christians for what I'm looking for, I'm not going to look for ham, to Ham for, for a, uh, a definition of it. I may look to Ham for Ham to, def to describe and define to me what he's doing and what he believes about what he's doing. But as far as judging it and finding out the truth of it and finding out how right or wrong it is, I'm going to go to Shem. You see what I mean? I'm going to go back to the source of truth, which is Shem. So therefore, Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz are not going to be my teachers. The Illuminati are not. Now, here's the thing. All right, now let's say that Jeremy James, you look at the article there on the, on the website, you go back and read if you have time, it's huge. This one's 200 and something pages on uh, London, uh, Nimrod, the occult, London, and uh, these, these symbols and these signs, they attach a lot to symbols. They attach a lot to dates. They attach a lot to colors. They attach a lot to uh, communications with spirits. The occult world, this is why 9-11 this year, you understand that, the, that Islam worships the moon god, which is a different study in itself completely. It's just as occult as it can be. Any man that can take a little girl like, the, like this and cut her head off, he's demon-possessed. I mean, that's, that's a fact. That's a fact. I don't care what they call themselves. That's a fact. And so, therefore, there's only two sources of, 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 of knowledge. In Genesis 3, the serpent said, God doth know. In plain words, there's another source of knowledge. That the day you eat thereof, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. All right. He told a huge lie with the skin of the truth. What do you do? You've got to go back to the source of truth, which is the Word of God, which is the Bible. Does the Bible say anything about the constellations? Absolutely. Does it say anything about, uh, about, uh, about the stars in the heavens? Absolutely. Does the Bible say anything about the tower that was raised up? Yes, sir. Does the Bible talk about the Queen of Heaven? Oh, yeah. Does the Bible talk about people who had curious arts and the occult world and they took their books and burned them in the book of Acts? Oh, yes. Does the Bible have something to say about demons? You better believe it does. Does the Bible then speak about these things? Yes, sir, it does. But that's the point. If it doesn't agree with the Bible, out the door with it. And if you'll stick on that, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll be a whole lot better off. A whole lot. Now, there's an instrument down there in Egypt called the Great Pyramid. I'm sure everybody, how many's heard of the Great Pyramid? Everybody has by now. We've run out of time. It's 15 till. Boy, that 45 minutes flew by. I can't, uh, I was going to get into it with you this morning, but uh, we'll have to pick it up again next week. This time flies by in here, folks. Well, it does if you're if you're interested in what you're doing. And my biggest problem was when I went to school, I'd bored to death with everything. <laughs> and the only thing I learned in school is how to read and write. <laughs> Since I got out, that I did all 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 my reading and research. But I'm thankful they taught me how to read and write and add and subtract. <laughs> all right, we'll have a word of prayer. We'll pick it up next week. <coughs> Brother Valance, will you dismiss us, please?